I'd invite you to please remain standing as Jane Allison and Nora Boos come and read this morning's scripture for us. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13, through chapter 2, verse 3. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each one's work impartially, conduct yourselves in reverent fear during your stay as foreigners. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life that you inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or spot. He was known before the foundation of the world, but was, a, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls by obedience to the truth, so that you have a genuine love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from a pure heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was proclaimed to you. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Great. Thank you, Jane and Nora. Please be seated. Well, good morning again, everyone, and I want to say a special welcome to uh, the guests, any guests that are with us. Welcome to Woodside. And uh, we here at Woodside are in a series called Exiles, where we are going through the book of First Peter. And Peter wrote this particular letter uh, to some Christians who were being persecuted because of their faith in Christ. And so he was writing to them, helping them to think through what it looked like to follow Jesus faithfully in a world that wasn't. And before he begins sharing with them how they are to respond and how they're to act, and we're going to find over 30 imperatives, 30 commands, he begins first with who they are in God's eyes. He begins with the words that you are an elect exile, that you are just a foreigner a stranger, a sojourner who is just passing through. This is not your real home. You are going to God. You are elected and chosen of God. And so the world may reject you, but as you journey through life, remind yourself you are chosen of God. So he reminds them of who they are in God's eyes. And then he speaks to them about where they are in God's story that you are after Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection on the cross but you're before his return. You're in the in-between time. And so with that in mind, he then instructs them of how they are to follow Jesus faithfully. And this letter is relevant uh, for us 2,000 years later because around the world, uh, there are followers of Jesus who are being persecuted for their faith. Most of us here, in, well, all of us here in Canada, none of us are being beaten or imprisoned or losing our lives. Uh, but we too in here in Canada, in an increasingly secular society, are experiencing pushback because of our faith in Jesus. It may be at work, it may be in your family or extended family, it may be at your school, it may be in the community where you are looked on a little differently maybe quite not with it. You're not so popular because you're not thinking and doing what everybody else does. And uh, you may be here this morning and you feel a bit excluded uh, from people because of your faith in Jesus. Peter's letter is written to us as well. 
Now, before we look at his instructions, and there's four commands we're looking at this morning, I want to quickly run through the stages of persecution. This is uh, by Charles Pope, who is from the Washington, D.C. area. He's looked at church history, and he's identified persecution of Christian uh, in five stages. So let's quickly go through them. The first one is stage one, stereotyping. And this is when a description of a few starts to be used to describe an entire group. It's used over and over. And he talks about how here in North America in the 1960s and 70s, uh, followers of Jesus, Christians, were caricatured as Bible thumpers, simpletons, haters of science, hypocrites. They were labeled as self-righteous and old-fashioned. They were backwards. They couldn't be free from their shackles of religion. And so that still carries over to uh, today. Uh, so the and then the second stage is vilifying, where this group is stereotyped, but then they are spoken against, and they're described with derogatory terms, and some of them still are around today, closed-minded, intolerant, bigoted, and that's where people are uh, kind of instructed to have a self-righteous indignation at this group for what they believe and what they do. Third stage is marginalizing. Uh, where this group then has to be um, taken from the public square and put on the margins of society, that they cannot speak and, and, and talk about their faith in public. They have to go to their a private domain and uh, where um, talk of Jesus is unacceptable and intolerable and uh, will not be uh, appreciated. And uh, we see this today, right, where uh, in public prayers uh, you can pray, but don't mention the name of Jesus in your prayer uh, as a valedictorian or as a uh, maybe uh, in some commencement address. Um, you can maybe mention God, but don't you mention Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and that people need him. And uh, really, in some places in North America, the only place in the public square that you can use the name Jesus is if you're using him as a swear word, right, as profanity. That's acceptable, but anything else is not. So push to the margins of society. And then number four is criminalizing, where there's legislation and lawsuits directed against practicing Christians. And in North America, weekly, there are new lawsuits because you have Christians who are practicing their faith in a culture that doesn't appreciate it, and there's clashes. So there's uh, court cases to do with hospitals, court cases to do with schools, even parks. And uh, so we see that stage as well. And then stage five is persecuting, when then there's just outright um, beating, uh, incarceration, violence, and death. So the first, fifth one is persecuting. I want to just remind you that today, as we are looking at First Peter's letter, it is so relevant because in our world, there are people suffering for their faith uh, in Jesus. So here, uh, this is... Uh, a map, uh, and it's listing the countries where there's extreme persecution, high persecu very high persecution, and high persecution. And this is put out by Open Doors Ministry. They are a ministry that help and advocate on behalf of persecuted Christians around the world. And every year they put out uh, uh, the top, a list of the top 50 countries uh, of persecution against Christians. And so on our map, uh, you'll see the orange space is extreme uh, uh, the orange uh, identifying extreme persecution. And over here, right here is North Korea, and for almost about the last 20 years, that's been the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian, so they're experiencing that there. Uh, the second uh, country on the list is Afghanistan, right in here. Third is uh, Somalia, down on the eastern coast of Africa. Fourth is Libya, up here. And then fifth is Pakistan, uh, right in here. And it's interesting, we've seen in recent years in India, um, Hindu nationalists who are leading a crackdown on, um, on Christianity. And um, many states in India now have anti-conversion laws. So if you uh, try to, to share your faith about Jesus, uh, you can lose your home, you can be imprisoned, a whole bunch of things. And even in China, many of us are familiar with China and the rule of communism and, and their leaders and how they're trying to crack down um, you know, uh, with the people of Hong Kong. But they are cracking down as well uh, uh, with people... Uh, that profess uh, Christ. And so if you don't, you are subservient to the leader of China. 
and interesting. In Rome, 2,000 years ago, you could practice your faith, uh, Christian faith, in a little group, but it, you all, you had to, it had to be under Caesar. He was the god that you were to bow to, and you were to, to uh, have certain temple rituals that you'd be involved in. And so interesting, the connection between Rome and, and China. Um, so uh, today there still is persecution. In fact, some of us were here yesterday and some, um, with the Malik family, and uh, they fled Pakistan because of persecution. And uh, yesterday at a gathering, there was a, a fellow from Pakistan uh, who back in, I believe it was 2002, uh, was in a church in Pakistan, and a fellow came in with uh, hand grenades and blew up this church, and 10 people died, and he lost his, uh, the eyesight in his right eye, and you could tell his right eye was a bit defig- disfigured. And uh, he uh, was still a follower of Jesus, even though that happened to him that he still stood fast in his faith. Why? Because he's like so many other people who are exiles just passing through, that this is not their home. Uh, so I invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 as we look at the commands given to exiles so that we too may be faithful to Jesus. So the first command that Peter gives is found in verse 13. Set your hope on Jesus. If you are experiencing any ridicule for your faith or you're being excluded for your faith, set your hope on Jesus. We read in verse 13, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Many people today will tell you to set your hope on your money, set your hope on uh, your beauty, set your hope on so many things. Just don't set it on the Maple Leafs, but set it on so many other things. Uh, One lady years ago uh, was going through a very difficult time, and her hope was, she said, what gets me through the day is the next release uh, of the Harry Potter novels. Can you imagine that? Okay, that's somebody that needs to hear about Jesus. But people go from hope to hope to hope. And Peter says, for you, you set your mind, your hope on the grace when Jesus is revealed. Peter, what dominates this letter is the second return of Jesus Christ. Peter saw Jesus hang, he saw him dead, and then he saw him raised from life. And he spoke over and over again that the same Jesus is coming again and he's telling these followers of Jesus set your mind, set your hope on his return when his grace, his goodness, his generosity is you, you experience it really as never before so as you journey through life that's what you keep thinking about culture says it's all about your small story it's all about the present you don't think about tomorrow and the future and what happens after you die but Peter says no, you live with this eternal perspective, the reality of the eternal as you go through it. Every day, do you think about Jesus? Do you think about meeting Jesus? Peter says, he says, therefore, in light of who you are, where you are in the story, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your minds, set your hope on Jesus. That idea of alert is that you're not asleep. You're not naive. You're not unaware of history and what's happening and where it's going and the challenges of living out your faith. You're you're engaged. You're aware. And that idea of fully sober, you're not a drunken stupor. You're not just kind of like going through life. He is taking really water and he's throwing it on their faces and saying, wake up, make sure you're awake and you're alert and that every day you've got your hope, your mind set on Jesus and as we look down through history, those first followers of Jesus, but all, so many followers of Jesus were able to stand strong in their faith because they realized that this was not their home. They were going to their real home, and it was with Jesus. There's so many stories. If you, know, if you have children, you want to help them to grow in their faith, give them a book, of, a biography of someone that has been faithful to Jesus. Uh, I'd like to point out one. It's by Richard Wormbrand, and he uh, lived over in Romania, and uh, d- just after World War II. And in Romania, uh, there was the Soviet occupation. And so the communist government sent in the Soviet military into the land, and a number of Romanians, and in particular Christians, were imprisoned. And Richard Wormbrand uh, spent 14 
years in prison for his faith in Jesus. He was arrested on his way home from church, and uh, he was in prison. And in fact, three of those years, he was in solitary confinement. So here was a guy, and it's, it's horrific to, to read what he went through. But he shares this in his book, Tortured for Christ. He shares this story with us. He writes this, It was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. So you cannot speak about Jesus. It was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching, so we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preached, and they beat us. We were happy preaching, they were happy beating us, so everyone was happy. Isn't that amazing? Like, how can that be? It's because this place was not his home. He had a view of Jesus, and he was living for Jesus. He, uh, in fact, when he was released, uh, he and his wife, who was in prison as well, founded the Christian ministry, uh, Voice of the Martyrs, which is a ministry that helps support and advocate uh, persecuted Christians around the world. And it's interesting, when he was released, he's now, uh, he's since died, but he uh, ended up appearing before a subcommittee in the U.S. Senate, and during his kind of testimonial, he took off his shirt and he showed the beatings that he'd received, and uh, it it was caught, and it became international news and garnered a lot of attention. So here was a follower of Jesus who's got his hope set on Jesus. We're going to preach, beat us, we're going to keep talking about Jesus. The second command we find, uh, so set your hope on Jesus, the second command is to be holy. And what is interesting, the first command, when you're living with Jesus in mind every day, it fuels obedience to the other three commands that Peter makes. That this hope in Jesus, it produces holiness. Peter continues in his letter, verse 14, as obedient children do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. He says, when you used to live in ignorance, when you didn't know Jesus and the story and the good news about Jesus, you just followed your evil desires. You did what everybody else did. You went along. You believed what they believed. You did all that they did. And you just went, you were molded. But he says, that's not who you are anymore. Don't just go along with what everybody else is believing. Don't go, go along with what everybody else is doing. Instead, you're a child of God. You are to be molded by God. He is holy. He is set apart. As you journey through life, you practice being set apart, being molded by him. And holiness, we think of being set apart not only from something, from sin, but we're set apart to something, to God. And folks, this is really hard to do, right? It is so easy. We're discipled by our culture that we're just constantly being told, this is what to believe, and this is how you're to act. And it really takes a mindset on Jesus to saying, I'm not believing that, and I'm not doing that. I want to do what God wants me to do. Paul, Peter then continues talking about why we are um, um, to be holy. And two reasons. One is we go through life practicing holiness because of the fear of God, and secondly, because of the love of God. Verse 17, he speaks about that fear. Since you call in a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So as a foreigner, as an exile, as you go through life, you live with this reverential fear of God, this holy fear of God, this healthy fear of God. We live in a culture that not only in culture but in the church, many people are discounting and don't believe in a God who judges. Well, my God is a God of love. He doesn't judge. And Peter is sharing, that's not true. God is a God who judges. He is holy and he is love. And because of that, he has to judge sin. Nobody can get away with mistreating a child or a woman or or a fellow human being. Nobody can do those things and get away with it because there's a God who has to judge it all. It's who he is. He loves people and he's holy. 
And so he has to judge it. And these followers of Jesus, their judgment for their sin was all placed on Christ on the cross. And if you're a follower of Jesus, all of your judgment is placed on Christ on the cross, all, all of your sin. So you're forgiven of those sins. But you are still going to stand one day before a judge and give an account of your life. It's not something you fear, but it's this sense of living in light of that day. And uh, we will uh, have uh, rewards and loss of rewards. And what Peter's saying, it matters how you live. So live with this fear of God. He's God, and I'm man, I'm woman, and I am to obey him. And then secondly, um, we are to be holy because he's a God of love. Uh, he continues, verse 18, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Notice that phrase, empty way of life. Before you knew Jesus, you were living an empty way of life, and you were redeemed. But it wasn't with silver or gold, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. And Peter is saying there, you're following the one who was rejected, but he was chosen. Just like you are rejected, but you are chosen. Before Genesis 1-1, before the creation of the world, in God's eternal plan, it was decided that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would come and die on a cross for the sins of the world. And that we are given a choice to receive that forgiveness, receive him as our Savior and Lord, or uh, we can choose not to. And so Peter is saying to them, when you journey through life as an exile, remind yourself daily of your hope in Jesus and keep reminding yourself of of how great God is and, and how holy he is but also remind yourself of how loving God is, that he loves you. So setting our minds on Jesus, it fuels holiness. And for all of us here, I think we can all attest, it is a struggle. And by the way, if you're not struggling, battling sin, uh, chances are is that you're caught up in the here and now, and you're just going along with people. So it is a struggle for us. Command number two, or three rather, is about love. And this, this hope that we have in Jesus produces or fuels love. Verse 22, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart for you have been born again. Notice that command to love one another. So you see the people beside you that are other followers of Jesus? Okay, you're commanded to love them with a sincere love. A deep love means that the word deeply has the idea of stretching, straining. Anybody here loving a person? You can identify, what stretches me? It strains me, right? But notice, too, it's from the heart. It's an inside-out job. It's not you clenching, us clenching our fists and saying, i got to love this person. It's, it's focusing, setting our hope on Jesus, and as we're filled with that hope, it fills us with his love. Jesus died for me, rose again, and one day I'm going to live with him forever. He loves me so much. And because that is on my mind, that love then begins to spill over into my other relationships. So we are a family, folks, here, and we are called to love one another. And uh, I want to ask you, is your capacity growing to love other people? Because if it's not, you need to get some water splashed on you. Jesus is coming again. Live in light of his return. Love people. Love people deeply. And then the fourth command Uh, This hope of setting our hope on Jesus produces a craving for God's word. We, We have this desire, this longing for his word. Peter continues in verse 23, for you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Peter uses that term born again a few times in this letter. And uh, have you ever heard the term, uh, or the, yeah, the term, I'm a born again Christian, right? You ever heard the term, I'm a born again Christian. Folks, There's no other thing except a born-again Christian. If you're not born again, you're not a Christian, right? Now, years ago, I think it was used as a distinction because people would say it was attached to politics. 
So I'm a born-again Christian who's all into politics. Well, I'm just a Christian who's not. A born-again Christian is a redundant phrase. We have to experience this new birth. So if you're a Christian here, and you're a Christian who just goes to church, and you're a nice person, but you've never experienced this new birth, you've never personally received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you're not really a Christian. And Peter is saying, you're a born-again Christian, and because of this new birth, I want to tell you how it happened. He said it wasn't a perishable seed, it wasn't biological or physical, this birth, but it was spiritual, it was imperishable seed. It was the word of God. You heard the word of God, the good news of Jesus, and you responded, and you were born again, born uh, spiritually. Notice, too, he refers to the word of God as living, which is transforming and enduring. It goes on forever. And then he quotes from Isaiah 40 to share with those going through this persecution that the word of God is going to go on forever. It is so important to crave it, to have it. And he says this, For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So he's contrasting people and their voices with the word of God. So in other words, today, as you journey through life, you're reminding yourself that people are like grass. So when you, how many of you are on Twitter? You don't have to raise your hand. Some of us are on Twitter. You're on Twitter? Okay, I'm not on there. I can't take Twitter, but some of you may be on Twitter. How many of you here listen to music? How many of you read books or the paper? How many of you watch movies? How many of you hear people in your workplace or family talking to you? And Peter is saying to us, all of those opinions, all of those beliefs, it's it's like grass. People are like grass. They just... It's there for a while, and then it withers. And then a new group of people, and they start speaking their voices, and you keep going through time. It just withers. You do not want to listen to what some... i got to be careful here. Um, there are so many people that are being discipled by the world and Christians where they're letting in the thinking of this world. And Peter's saying, don't do that because people are like grass. Instead, set your mind on the word of God. It's enduring, it's transformative, that it will never uh, fall. It endures forever. A couple notes for us, just a reminders for us in the culture in which we find ourselves, is that as followers of Jesus, we continue to hold up the word of God and we, because it's the truth, that Jesus ultimately is, is, or Jesus is the ultimate truth, but then he has spoken through his word, which is truth. And so we always hold it up. Number one, we don't dismiss God's word. There are people today who are being told by people, oh, the Bible's got contradictions in it. The Bible's full of myths. The Bible is old-fashioned. The Bible is misogynistic. The Bible is this. And people believe it. They dismiss it without even investigating it. And that's, that's the challenge for us today. Uh, Michael and Lauren McAfee have written a book, Not What You Think, and they they say that they're millennials, they don't like the term, but they're millennials, and they wrote this book for millennials, and it's a book sharing, uh, this book is is about uh, taking a look at the Bible for yourself, and if you have a young person here, or you're a young person here, I'd recommend that book, Not What You Think, but what spurred the writing of this book is that this married couple, they met at the University of Oklahoma, And one day, uh, one night, they went to a lecture. It was part of their religion class. And they heard a particular speaker. He's still speaking today. And uh, he claims that he was once a Christian and believed the Bible, but today he doesn't. And because the Bible's got, it's full of contradictions and myths, and it's, there's parts that aren't true. And so he gives this lecture to these students at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, this this couple, uh, it was actually a date they had, um, they were kind of amazed at how he was able to share those things, but there was nobody to challenge him. He was just able to give the lecture, nobody challenged him. But what was even more amazing is that a number of the students just readily dismissed the Bible because of what this guy said. Today, there, is, there are scholars who are doing research and we're getting more information and more evidence as to the historicity of scripture. And uh, so we, uh, most of us here, we're not going to dismiss it. But the challenge for us in this culture 
is that we might reinterpret it through the lens of culture. With Orthodox Christianity, this being the word of God, we have always used scripture as the grid um, to determine everything, to see everything. We filter everything through scripture. So when it looks at, we look at culture, and we can say, well, according to God's word, that's right and that's wrong. This is how we're to live. This is how God made us. This is true. That's a lie. We look through the grid of scripture. But there's something today that has been creeping into churches uh, called progressive theology, where we're now enlightened. And so we're not looking through scripture at culture, but they flipped it and they're looking through culture at scripture. And if you've noticed what culture says and scripture says, uh, they don't equate. And so culture says this is right and this is wrong and this is truth and this is false. And they're taking what culture says and they're going back and looking and trying to interpret scripture. Uh, And this, uh, someone who is very close to that movement um, has shared that uh, ultimately, in the long view, progressive theology kills faith and kills discipleship to Jesus. There's been a few books that have come out recently by someone who, who, you know, I was raised in church, and I read the Bible, and here's what my church taught, and I used to believe all those stories are real, but right now, uh, I'm not so sure, and I think that maybe the history isn't, uh, isn't the point of the author. The point of the author is trying to communicate a theological point, uh, and so I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about the Bible. Do you know what that does? It puts you as the authority instead of Scripture being the authority. How I see the Bible, how I interpret it is, is the authority. And I just want to warn us all against progressive theology and that movement. Uh, uh, it leads really to um, the killing of our faith. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't look at the hard passages. We can't ignore them. We don't dismiss them. We have to grapple with them. What about violence in the Old Testament? What about, and there's a number of things in Scripture. Jonah being swallowed by a whale. Come on, this is, don't you have your 21st uh, common sense? I mean, Jonah's swallowed by, are you really? Okay, so we have to grapple with these passages, but we do so realizing there's different genres of scripture and realizing there's complexity and nuances to each text. And I just want to assure you, there are scholars out there that know more maybe than than you or I do, and they're grappling, and they can counter these arguments and say, no, we are looking through scripture. That is our grid. And sorry about that. I just, I I guess, wanted to just warn us that the word of God endures forever. I think it was the late 3rd century, early 4th century uh, Emperor Diocletian um, throughout the Roman Empire. The word of God was to be burned. It was to be eradicated. And here we are 2,000 years later, and the word of God still goes on. It endures forever. Peter continues, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. As you've got your hope set on Jesus, rid yourself. The idea here is take off your soiled clothes. This is not who you are. Think of Jesus and get slander off of you. Get malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy. Those things are not appropriate clothing for you. Instead, get on the character of God, his holiness, his love. And then he says this in verses 2 and 3, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. So there's the, the fourth command. Crave the word of God, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Uses the picture of a newborn baby being nursed by his or her mother. And I'm not getting into lactation and all of that, but I do want to say, I think most of us have seen a newborn baby that's not fed. And what does that baby do? Cry. I was talking to someone yesterday, and I said on our first baby, whenever we were traveling in the car, the baby would cry, and we're looking for the nearest exit to pull over and feed the baby, right? By our third child, it was a little longer wait, right? Not too long. But we all know a little baby just depending on nourishment. And Peter is saying, as you as an exile go through a world and you're experiencing pushback, set your hope on Jesus 
Keep seeking to be molded by him that you're, 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 you're wanting to be holy. Keep loving people and then keep desiring the word of God. And so he, he says, you're the ones that have tasted that the Lord is good. Just a note before we close this text this morning. Who is Peter writing to? He's writing to followers of Jesus who, is, who have tasted that the Lord is good, who have been born again, who have this living hope. He's not writing to people that aren't Christians. And are called to live and it starts with setting our hope on Jesus so today may each of us get a little water thrown in our face let's wake up and let's think about and love Jesus uh, before I pray